Have you ever heard of a thing called an ETF or exchange traded fund? And you're wondering what's all the fuss about? If you have questions about that, I have some answers for you. Before I start on this video, I want to remind you that I have a free workshop that is available to you by clicking on the link in the description box below this video. It's about 90 minutes long. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just trying to offer you some insight and different ways that I think and to help you possibly think in different ways yourself. The coverage includes a lot of different areas. Of course, I talk about the financial markets in general and a little bit about the stock market itself. I also cover sports. I'm a big fan of sports. Music. I've been playing music since I was very young. And I also talk about professional and personal relationships. The goal of this workshop is to help you to think in either new or different ways, as well as for you to get to know me and my style. One thing that's become very popular over the last 20 years is a thing called exchange traded funds or we usually just know them by their acronym ETF. ETFs are similar to mutual funds so if you're a real fan of mutual funds you might really like ETFs. However an ETF can be bought or sold just like a share of stock. If you watch the video right before this where I talk about mutual funds there's only one price that is set for that mutual fund each day and it's after the market closes. An ETF is like a mutual fund in that it can have a basket of different stocks in it, but you can buy and sell it while the market is open just like you would a share of stock. ETF transactions can take place during market hours. Mutual funds typically are only entered or exited once per day. There are exceptions to that. Some investors like the flexibility of an ETF because you can get in and you can get out quicker. Other people like mutual funds better because there's only one price and that's calculated after the market closes and you don't have to worry about all of the noise that happened for any particular trading day. Index mutual funds were available in the 1970s and as I talked about in the previous video, John Bogle was really the inventor of index mutual funds. It started off as a real embarrassment, but now has become a really popular thing to do. ETFs were created in 1993. The SPY, we also call these the spiders, which is based on the S&P 500, was the first ETF. Since their inception, ETFs have grown to be very popular. So think about it like a mutual fund that you can trade during the day. As of 2020, there were well over 7,200 ETFs available. There are now as many, if not more, ETFs available than there are mutual funds. This has become all the rage. They're very popular, which makes them interesting and something that we should really look at. But there are some real danger signs that we need to talk about as well, and I'll cover that later on. ETFs are an excellent vehicle for new as well as seasoned investors. If you're just starting out and you don't know a lot about the stock market, ETFs can be a good way to go. If you've been investing 40-50 years, you might find that ETFs are exactly what you need. On this next page, I have a chart that just shows you the growth in the number of ETFs. I got this from Statista.com. We started off with just one, and then in 2003, it grew to 276 and all the way over on the right hand side were well over 7,600 and there's more coming on the market all the time. Some of them, just like mutual funds, may cease to exist and other ETFs are being created all the time. When we look at the total number of assets in ETFs from 2002 up to 2019, that's the most recent chart I could find, we can see that there's a real increase and the trend is still pretty much in place. We'll see this continue to increase over time as other investors find that they like ETFs better than mutual funds. At the time I record this, these are the top 10 largest ETFs and the very first one is the one that I focus on the most. That's the SPY or SPDR, 
That's based on the S&P 500. At the very top part, you can see the AUM, that's Assets Under Management, and it's way number one. And then we also have Volume. That's a really big deal. Usually, the SPY is number one in volume every day. And that's really important to us because volume helps keep the bid-ask spreads tighter so we get better prices when we're getting in and when we're getting out, and we can also have things execute faster. Some other ETFs that you might see on this chart that you recognize, you'll notice that a lot of them are based on the S&P 500. The IVV, number two, that's an S&P 500 ETF. You have the Vanguard, VOO, that's based on the S&P 500. And a lot of them are based on different indexes, with the S&P 500 being the main index. Another ETF that's kind of a high flyer at the time I record this is called ARC. ARC Innovation ETF. And the person that manages that, her name is Kathy Wood. You can find her videos on YouTube and other people talk about her videos on YouTube. I've started to follow some of the videos that she posts. And she's kind of the rock star right now when it comes to market analysis and what's going to happen. Instead of basing things on an index, she actually goes out and picks the stocks like an active mutual fund manager would do and then puts those into the ETF that she manages. And she's become very popular. If the market is going up, you can see there's a real increase in value during that time. When we see some problems on the horizon, this ETF can really go down in value. So paying attention to this ETF might be something that you find interesting to watch. I watch it every day, even though I personally don't invest in this ETF. Let's compare ETFs and mutual funds. Some of the ways that they're similar are that you get diversification. If you own an index fund, you own a little bit of every stock in the S&P 500 or whatever index you're investing in. If you own the SPY, you own a little bit of all of the different companies that make up the S&P 500. So you don't have all of your eggs in one basket. With an ETF, you also get professional management. Just like Kathy Wood that I talked about, she's a professional money manager. With the ETF that you may be involved in, there is a person that manages that ETF, just like you would get with a mutual fund. There are a lot of ETFs that mirror an index. It may be the Dow the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, or any number of different indexes that are available. There are also what are called enhanced or inverse ETFs that are available. There's also options that are available on this, but that's kind of beyond what I want to talk about in this video. If you like the idea that the S&P 500 will go up 1%, you might really like it if you get into an ETF that goes up 2 or maybe 3% with that same move. Sometimes we call those juiced ETFs. They can be really nice when you're right, but they can be pretty painful when you're wrong. There's also a thing called inverse ETFs, just like there are inverse mutual funds. If the S&P goes up 1%, an ETF may go down 1, 2, or 3%, depending on the type of ETF you are involved in. ETFs can be used in an IRA, but please double check this with your financial professional. Different retirement accounts will have different rules that you have to follow. Typically, what I found is that these can be used in an IRA or a Roth IRA. Some of the differences between ETFs and mutual funds are that ETFs have a larger selection of indexes than index mutual funds. It's easier to manage these things like a share of stock than it is to manage them like a mutual fund. And they're all the rage right now, so you're hearing a lot about them. There are websites out there that are dedicated to just talking about ETFs. Costs involve commissions to a broker rather than expenses paid to a mutual fund company. So if you want to trade ETFs, you will probably need some kind of brokerage account. Now that may be tied in to your mutual funds. A lot of mutual fund companies are also brokerage outfits. Or you may have to open up a completely separate account to trade ETFs. ETF dividends or interest received are distributed each quarter. That's one of the drawbacks. They have to keep that money around. It doesn't go to work right away. Whereas index mutual funds immediately invest those dividends or interest income. 
The idea is to get that money into the market as fast as possible. You'll do that faster with index mutual funds than you will with ETFs. Odd lot purchases or sales tend to be easier with an index mutual fund than with an ETF. If you purchase an ETF and it's based on a dollar amount, you're going to end up with a really weird number of shares. That might be a little more confusing for you or even your broker. Index mutual funds or mutual fund companies have been doing this for a long time already. They're used to people putting in the same amount of money every month and then they just do a quick calculation to decide how many shares of that mutual fund do you own. With index mutual funds, it's usually easier to dollar cost average. So if you just put in $50 a month, $100 a month over a period of time, regardless of what the market's actually doing, that is called dollar cost averaging. Over a longer period of time, when the markets go down, you're seeing an overall decrease in the purchase price of the shares that you bought. You can also do this with ETFs, but it's a lot easier to do with index mutual funds. Now you might have different experiences with that. This is just what I have found myself. Some ETFs may not be liquid. We need trading volume behind these ETFs. There's some really interesting ETFs out there that would be kind of fun to get into, but the volume is so small, that means the bid ask price is so far apart, you're not going to get a real favorable price either getting in or getting out. Or you may not be able to execute that trade in a timely manner. Sometimes when there's not a lot of liquidity in an ETF, not only can it make the bid ask spread quite wide, but it may give you some kind of a skewed balance because you have sale prices and purchase prices that are far apart and that can get out of line with the stocks or index that's actually tracking with that ETF. ETFs must be purchased through a broker, whereas index mutual funds are purchased through a mutual fund company. For some of you, like I said before, this may not be a problem. You might have one in the same all set up already. You may just deal with a mutual fund company and you like the idea of ETFs, so now you're going to have to set up a brokerage account. The chart on this next slide just shows the cumulative fund flows from 2010 up through 2020, and I ended up getting this chart from Morningstar. They're not only really good at analyzing mutual funds, they become a real player when it comes to analyzing ETFs. Over on the left-hand side in 2010, we saw outflows from mutual funds, and then the trend got a little bit higher. It depends on what the market is doing, especially with the index ETFs. If the market's going up, everybody wants to jump in. If the market's going down, people usually want to get out, and they do it at exactly the wrong time. If you look way over on the right-hand side, you can see in 2020, we saw inflows into ETFs, but we saw a pretty big outflow from index mutual funds. And that's kind of the trend that we're seeing. You can just see how things have changed from 2010 up through 2020, where typically we'll see inflows into ETFs, those are the blue blocks there, where we often see outflows of open-ended mutual funds. Open-ended means that there's no limit. Anybody can get into those funds if you have the money. But the trend over a period of time has been mutual funds are becoming less popular and ETFs are becoming more popular. Then when the market blows up, nothing becomes very popular for a while. Let's look at the very first ETF, which is the ETF that I use the most. That's the SPY. It's the Spider S&P 500 ETF, and it's a trust that seeks to provide investment results that, before expenses, generally correspond to the price and yield of the S&P 500. The idea is to have a one-to-one -one relationship. If the S&P goes up or down 1%, this ETF will go up or down 1% as well. The ticker symbol is SPY. You can just stick this into Google and it will bring up the current price and probably a chart. It first started trading in January of 1993. Nobody was really sure if this idea was going to catch on. Just like in the 70s, when John Bogle created the index mutual fund, they laughed at him at first. Well, now he's laughing. If you want to find out more about the SPY, you can go to the spdrs.com website, and they have all kinds of information that you can look at. I usually let volume be the real dictate over whether I'm interested in an ETF or not. 
if a lot of people that are smarter than me and do a lot more analysis than me, if they're getting into these things on a consistent basis, then I'm more inclined to look at that as well. I'm not talking about just short-term blips. I'm talking about consistently over a period of time. Here is a chart of the SPY going all the way back to when it was first introduced. We can see here that if you put a chart of the S&P 500 right here with it, they will pretty much go hand in hand with each other. It's seen a massive increase in daily volume since 1993. And at the time I prepared this chart, at the end of March 2021, the average daily volume is about 112 million shares per day. Most of the time it comes in number one as the most traded vehicle in existence in the stock market. On the bottom, you can just see how volume has really increased. Some of the big players will use ETFs for hedging. So we might get some false signals. They get into an ETF and we go, oh, they're buying. More people are buying. Well, really, what they're doing is they're using that as a form of hedging against another portfolio. And you can do the same thing. The volume that you see here has actually gone down. There's other vehicles at the time I record this that have been really popular and the market's going through a lot of gyrations and different changes. And so other ETFs are kind of stepping up and having more daily volume. But typically over a long period of time, the SPY will always be number one. This just shows that. In the many times that I have taught this particular section of the class, the SPY is usually always a distant number one. Lately, we have the QQQs, which is a short ETF. That means that it goes up in value if the NASDAQ 100 goes down. That has seen a lot of volume as we're seeing tech stocks really get pushed around. And then we have a thing called the VIX, which is the fear gauge. And since it moves, people want to trade or bet on the direction of the fear gauge. There's an ETF attached to that. And sometimes lately that has become very popular as well. What are some different alternatives that you have with the SPY? The SPY is not the only game in town. Although it tries to track the S&P 500 on a one-to-one -one relationship. There are some enhanced SPYs and always follow the volume with these. There's more than one of these kinds of ETFs that I'm going to talk about. I'm just listing the ones that I think tend to have the greatest volume. That is a real deciding factor in how I do analysis. If nobody's getting into something and it's not very popular, you might get trapped into that investment and I don't want to have that happen. There is an ETF by ProShares Ultra and it's based on the S&P 500 and it goes two times. So if the S&P goes up 1%, this ETF is designed to go up 2% and the symbol is SSO. One that's a little more popular because we have some real risk takers out there and you can get as crazy with this as you want to is the ProShares Ultra Pro S&P 500 three times ETF. So if the S&P goes up 1%, this ETF will go up 3%. But please remember the inverse is also true. You can see some pretty hefty losses pretty quickly if you're really into these ETFs. There are also inverse ETFs, and again, follow the volume. Use those ETFs that have the greatest amount of average volume over a 30, 60, or 90-day period of time. There's something called the ProShares. This ETF is designed so that if the S&P goes down 1%, this ETF will go up 1%. So this gives us the ability to get into an ETF. We're not short selling, but we can still take advantage of downward movement by using these ETFs. Not to be outdone, there is a two times ETF as well as a three times ETF. And a lot of the real risk takers, a lot of the people that like a lot of excitement in the market, they tend to be flocking more towards the three times ETFs, both to the upside and to the downside. A second three times bear market ETF, which means we're going down, is the Direction Daily Large Cap Bear. One thing that I want to do is warn you about ETFs. As I do a lot of research and learning about different ETFs that come on the market, I'm noticing some trends. When you have a lot of things coming to the market at the same time, things might get overlooked and dangers that you didn't know were there may end up being there at some point in the future. There has been such an explosive growth in the number of new ETFs that are available to you. 
When anything sees growth at almost manic levels, which is kind of what we've seen over the last few years with the growth of ETFs, this can often mean that some sort of a bubble is forming or has already formed. There are people that think we are in some kind of a bubble right now in the stock market, in the bond market, and all over the place. Sometimes when you see a lot of herd mentality going to certain types of investments without really understanding them, that can often mean that we are in a bubble phase and bubbles pop. The SPY in various index ETFs should be just fine. The SPY, the one that I base everything on, that's been around and it stood the test of time. So I'm not as concerned about that. It's these new high flyer ETFs that come on the market. Those are the ones to be careful with and to really do a lot of research on them and maybe even see them over a period of time in different market climates before you put any real money on the line. A warning concerns new ETFs that may seem to appear overnight. The vetting or the testing phase needed to create a new TF has been decreased. So it's a lot easier to have ETFs come to market now. There are lots of different companies out there and they make money doing this. So if they can make money with 10 ETFs, they can make even more money with 100 ETFs and sometimes the quality is just not there. A lack of liquidity, volume, as well as the soundness of the company bringing that new ETF to the market should be examined. If it's a company that just started up and they don't really have a track record, you may decide to do business with them, but make sure you know what you're getting into. We not only need to look at the ETF, we need to look at the company behind the ETF. Tax implications should also be examined. Whenever you're getting in or getting out, depending on the ETF, that will usually trigger some kind of a taxable event, whether that's a capital gain or a capital loss. Another thing that we have to contend with with ETFs is alphabet soup. We got acronyms all over the place with these things. There are so many acronyms that require you to become familiar with them. We have an ETP, which is the general name given for an exchange traded product. The most popular ETPs are ETFs. How's that for throwing acronyms at you? We also have a thing called an ETN, an exchange traded note. And these are more like bonds. Maybe you don't want to participate directly in the bond market by buying bonds yourself. You can do that through an ETF. Then we have ETVs, exchange traded vehicles. And these usually have to do with futures contracts. If you deal with those commodities, sugar, cocoa, orange juice, and different currencies. There are ETFs based on the dollar, based on the euro, based on the Japanese yen. You can play all these different markets using ETFs. So the ETP field is growing rapidly with changes occurring frequently. Investors and traders need to keep informed about new products, opportunities, and strategies. And as I alluded to earlier, there's a lot of really good websites out there. And I'll provide some links to websites that I use. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. I really appreciate that. If desired, please click on the like or dislike button below. Please leave me any comments. That's what I really like is feedback, either positive or negative. Consider subscribing to this channel and clicking on the bell to be notified when new videos are posted. And I try to post about three videos each week. There's also the workshop that I talk about at the beginning of this video. So with that said, thank you very much and I'll see you in the next video.